Uh, thank you. Uh, this seems like a good way to start. Once upon a time, a man walks into a bar. A man walks into a bar. And he sees his best friend sitting at a table, and he runs up to him and says, Hey, how you doing? But before he can even say anything, he sees that on his best friend's table there's a little man playing a little piano very beautifully. And he asks the man, he says, Wow! He asks his friend, Wow! He's so small and he's so good at piano. Where did you get him? And his friend doesn't even look up from the table. He gives him a sort of distracted wave of his hand. And he says, Ah, there's a genie out in the alley, and the, and the genie's granting wishes. So Fred rushes out to the alley, throws open the door, and sure enough, there's a huge and splendid genie standing in the alley. And he kind of screws up his nerve, gets up his courage, says, Genie, please grant my wish. I'd like a million bucks. And the genie looks at him ominously for a moment, but then he nods his great head, and there's a huge flash of light in the alley. And when Fred can open his eyes again, the whole alleyway is full of the stench and clamor of a million quacking ducks. They're everywhere. They're pecking him. They're flapping their wings in his face. He manages to get the door open, and this cloud of ducks follows after him, quacking. And he yells to his best friend. He said, can you believe that stupid genie? I asked him for a million bucks, and he gave me a million ducks. And his friend finally looks up, and he's got a single tear rolling down his face. And he says, yeah, do you really think I asked the genie for a pianist that was 12 inches long? <laughs> so, jokes are stories. When we tell each other jokes, we're telling each other small, funny stories. And when we go see a stand-up comedian, we're going to watch a virtuoso oral fiction performer. It's a great example, I think, jokes, of the way story infiltrates our lives in ways we're hardly even aware of. So jokes are stories, and songs are stories, too. So a few years ago, I'm driving down the road on a beautiful fall day. I'm listening to the radio, spinning the FM dial, singing along, drumming my fingers. I'm in a great mood. And this country music song comes on the radio. And my normal response to this sort of absolute catastrophe is to form a fist and just, you know, hit the radio until the music stops, until this awful noise stops. But I'm in a good mood, I'm in a tolerant mood, so I decide to listen. And it's a song called Stealing Cinderella by Chuck Wicks. Probably a lot of you guys know it. It's a song about a little girl growing up to leave her father behind. And so one moment I'm driving along, I'm feeling good. And the next moment I'm crying so hard that I have to pull off the road to save my life and to mourn the time, still more than a decade off, when my own little girls would fly the nest, when they were going to abandon me. So I'm pulled off on the side of this highway with the traffic whizzing by, and I'm having this total meltdown. But part of me disassociated. I was like an out-of-body experience. And part of me is looking down at this guy who's a wreck in the car, and he's saying, whoa, what's happening here? Why is this happening? I'm a grown man. I'm not a weeper. I don't even like this music. And yet I'm crying. So I tell this story because I think a lot of people can relate to it. Who hasn't been snuck up on by a story in this way? Who hasn't been ambushed by a story? When we surrender ourselves to fiction, we allow ourselves to be invaded by the teller. Chuck Wooks was there in my head. He was in control of me, cognitively, emotionally, mentally. He was controlling the images in my head, the feelings in my heart. And so I wrote the book partly in an attempt to explain what happened to me that day. And in so doing, to try to understand something more about this vast and weird and witchy power of story in human life. So the book gets in on a very, very old debate. And the debate is, what is a human being? What is it? What most sets us apart from the rest of creation? When we call our species Homo sapien, we're making an argument. The argument is that it is human sapience, human wisdom, human intelligence that most sets our species apart. But other people say, no, we're not really all that rational and reasonable. 
It's really upright posture that sets us apart, or it's opposable thumbs which allow our really sophisticated tool use, or it's our complicated culture, it's our sophisticated language, and so on and so forth. And I'm not here to downgrade any of that stuff. All that stuff's important. I'm just saying one thing has been left off the list that's equally important, that's storytelling, the way we live our lives inside of story. So homo sapien, yeah, that's a pretty good definition, but homo fictus, fiction man, that's about equally as good. Man is the great ape with the storytelling mind. That's the argument of the book, okay? Let's ask another question, though. Let's ask this really kind of deep, profound, and super fundamental question. Why do we have storytelling at all? And let's see if we can make this question pop in your heads by running a simple thought experiment. So again, I want you to imagine that it's thousands, millions of years ago, a long, long time ago, and there's only two tribes, two human tribes, living side by side in some African valley. And the tribes are alike in every single way, except the way indicated by their names. One of these tribes is going to gradually pass away. The other tribe will inherit the earth. Both tribes haunt, both tribes gather, both tribes woo mates and rear children. But one of these tribes is called the story people, and one of these tribes is called the practical people. So the story people are out there doing their work all day, but sometimes during the day they get tired, they get bored, and they decide they're going to go back to the village and they're going to make up and trade wild lies about stuff that never happened. And they have a great time doing it. But while they're making up their stories, the practical people are still out there in the field. They're hunting more, they're gathering more, they're wooing more. And when they just can't do that work anymore, they don't waste their time on stories. They collapse. They go to sleep. They restore their energies for useful activity. So we know how the thought experiment ends. The story people are us. The story people inherited the earth. If those strictly practical people ever existed, they don't anymore. But here's the point. If we hadn't known that at the outset, wouldn't most of us have predicted that those frugal, utilitarian, practical people would have outcompeted those frivolous story people. The fact that they didn't, that's the evolutionary riddle of fiction. 